In section 4.2, we're going to look at exponents and properties, exponential functions, exponential equations, compound interest, the number e, and continuous compounding, and some exponential models. Recall the definition of a raised to the m over n. If a is a real number, m is an integer, n is a positive integer, and the nth root of a is a real number, then we have a raised to the m over n is equivalent to the nth root of a raised to the m power. Let's consider 16 raised to the 3 fourths power. This is equivalent to the fourth root of 16 raised to the third power. So we can evaluate the fourth root of 16, and that's going to be 2. So we have this is equivalent to 2 cubed. And 2 cubed is 8. We can also look at 27 raised to the negative 1 third. This is equivalent to 1 over 27 to the 1 third because the negative exponent goes to the bottom and we know that from this formula x to the negative n is equal to 1 over x to the n and that's from algebra 2. So we have 1 over 27 raised to the 1 third power is equivalent to 1 divided by now since the exponent is 1 third you know this is going to be the cube root of 27 and the cube root of 27 is just 3 so this simplifies to 1 third let's look at one more example let's try 64 raised to the negative 1 half 64 raised to the negative 1 half is equivalent to 1 over 64 raised to the 1 half again if it has a negative exponent we can bring it to the denominator and 64 to the 1 half is equivalent to the square root of 64 and this simplifies to 1 eighth so this is a quick review of rational exponents let's look at some additional properties of exponents for any real number a greater than 0 a not being equal to 1 the following statements are true. A. A raised to the x is a unique real number for all real numbers x. B. A raised to the b is equal to a raised to the c if and only if b equals c. In the property b, it's saying if we have the same base, let's say the base is a, and they're equal to one another, then the only way that's true is if the exponents are the same. So that's what property B is saying. C. If A is greater than 1 and M is less than N, then A to the M is less than A to the N. Property D. If 0 is less than A and that's less than 1 and M is less than N, then a to the m is greater than a to the n. This property is saying if you have a number that is from 0 to 1, and that means it's going to be a fraction less than 1, then it's actually the reverse. We have that m, although it is smaller than n, is going to still be larger because we have a fraction as a base, a fraction that is less than 1. Properties C and D say that when A is greater than 1, increasing the exponent on A leads to a greater number. But when 0 is less than A and that's less than 1, increasing the exponent on A leads to a lesser number. If f of x equals 2 to the x, find each of the following, f of negative 1. So we're going to plug in a negative 1 into the function. 2 raised to the negative 1 is equivalent to 1 half. Recall x to the negative n is equal to 1 over x to the n. So we're just using a formula of exponents and we get 1 half. Let's find f of 3. f of 3 is equal to 2 raised to the 3 and 2 to the third power is just 8. Let's try f of 5 over 2. f of 5 over 2 is equivalent to 
2 raised to the 5 over 2. Now recall we have x to the m over n is equivalent to the nth root of x raised to the m. Now this is a property of exponents, so we can use this formula to simplify this expression. So we have this is equivalent to 2 to the 5th, and we're going to take the square root of that. Now I know 2 to the 5th is 32, so we'll take the square root of 32. I know 32 has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 twos in it. Since we're taking the square root of 32, I'm looking for groups of 2. And so we have the square root of this group is 2. The square root of this group is 2. So we have a 4 in the front because it's 2 times 2. So 2 raised to the 5 over 2 simplifies to 4 root 2. Part D, I want to find f of 4.92. f of 4.92 is equivalent to 2 raised to the 4.92. Now we cannot do this unless we have a calculator, so we'll type it in the calculator. And this is approximately 30.2738. Exponential function. If a is greater than 0 and a is not equal to 1, then the exponential function with base a is f of x equals a to the x. Note, we do not allow 1 as the base for an exponential function. If a was equal to 1, then the function becomes the constant function defined by f of x equals 1 raised to the x, which is just equal to 1, which is not an exponential function. So let's look at an example of an exponential function. We're going to start with something really simple. Let's graph f of x equals 2 to the x. Now I'm going to create a table of just some random numbers so we can get a general idea of what this graph looks like. So we'll plug in negative 2 for the exponent here. So we can use our calculator or do the work by hand. 2 raised to the negative 2 is going to be 1 fourth. Plug it in the calculator and you'll get that the result is 1 fourth. 2 raised to the negative 1 is 1 half. 2 raised to the 0 is 1. 2 raised to the 1 is 2. 2 squared is going to give us 4 and 2 cubed is going to give us 8. So let's try to graph this. At negative 2 we have the point 1 fourth. At negative 1, it's a half. At 0, it's 1. At 2, it's 4. And at 3, is 8. So plot the points on a graph, and then we could roughly sketch what this looks like. So the function does appear to be growing as it goes to the right. We call this exponential growth. Let's look at another function. Let's graph instead f of x equals 1 half x. So in this case, our a is going to be between 0 and 1. In the previous case, a was greater than 1. So let's see what happens when we get a 1 half as our base. So we'll plug in negative 3 into the function here. So 1 half raised to the negative 3 is positive 8. So please check that with your calculators to make sure you get positive 8. 1 half raised to the negative 2 is positive 4. 1 half raised to the negative 1 is just 2. 1 half to the 0 is 1. 1 half to the 1 is 1 half. And 1 half squared is 1 fourth. So please double check these values on a calculator. So let's graph it. We'll go to negative 3 comma 8, negative 2 comma 4, negative 1 comma 2, 0, 1, 1 comma 1 half. So it appears that the graph is decreasing this time since a is between 0 and 1. So our graph is decreasing as we go to the right and it does not touch the x-axis, there is an asymptote. So let's draw our asymptote.
our domain is going to be from negative infinity to infinity and our range is going to go down to zero with a parentheses because there's an asymptote there and it goes up forever. Recall the graph of y equals f of negative x is the graph of y equals f of x re reflected across the y-axis. Thus we have the following. If f of x equals 2 raised to the x, then f of negative x equals 2 raised to the negative x. And we can split it up as 2 to the negative 1 raised to the x. And that means 2 to the negative 1 is equivalent to 1 half raised to the x. This is supported by our graph shown. If a is greater than 1, we know the graph is going to increase. If a is between 0 and 1, we know the graph is going to decrease. Let's look at the characteristics of the graph. f of x equals a to the x. The points negative 1, comma, 1 over a, 0, comma, 1, and 1, comma, a are on the graph. If a is greater than 1, then f is an increasing function. If a is between 0 and 1, then f is a decreasing function. The x-axis is a horizontal asymptote. The domain is negative infinity to infinity, and the range is from 0 to infinity. Let's graph f of x equals 1 over 5 raised to the x. Give the domain and range. Example 2, let's graph f of x equals 1 over 5 raised to the x. Let's give the domain and range also. Now I'm going to start by graphing a couple points. Let's say negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. And we'll see what the picture looks like. So 1 fifth to the negative 2 gives us 25. 1 fifth to the negative 1 gives us 5. 1 fifth to the 0 is 1. 1 fifth to the 1 is 1 fifth. And 1 fifth to the second power is 1 over 25. So negative 2 comma 25 does not fit on the graph, so we'll skip to the next one. 1 comma 1 fifth, let's say it's here. And 2 comma 1 over 25, so it's really, really close now. Now let's draw our decreasing function. We are just going to connect the points as best we can. And there's our function. Our domain is going to be from negative infinity to infinity. And our range is going to be from 0 to infinity. Because remember, we have an asymptote as our x-axis here. Example 3. Graph each function. Show the graph of y equals 2 to the x for comparison. Give the domain and range. So we know what the graph of y equals 2 to the x looks like already. We'll just plug in a couple points. So we'll start by graphing y equals 2 to the x. Now we can start part a. We want to graph f of x equals negative 2 raised to the x. Now in this case, there's a negative in the front, so we know there's a reflection across the x-axis. So we can use the graph and we can reflect it across the x-axis with a horizontal asymptote. So we're going to do a reflection here. We're trying to keep the same distance from the x-axis. And this is our graph. It is f of x equals negative 2 to the x, and it's just a reflection of 2 to the x. The domain of the blue graph is from negative infinity to infinity, and the range here is from negative infinity to 0, since it goes down forever. There's an asymptote here on the x-axis. We want to graph f of x equals 2 to the x plus 3, I will start by graphing our 2 to the x first for comparison. 
Now, what is the difference between this graph and our graph? Well, there's going to be a shift here. We know this is going to be shifted to the left three units. It's going to be shifted to the left three units. In general, we have f of x equals a to the x minus h plus k, and this is tell us how the shifting is going to work. The h is going to control the left and right. The k is going to control our up and down. So we know this is going to shift our graph to the left three units. So I'm going to start with each of these points, and I'm going to move them three units to the left. For each of the points, we'll move three units to the left. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. And now this is our graph. And now we can state our domain and range. The domain is still negative infinity to infinity. And the range is from zero to infinity. We'll not forget our asymptote. The asymptote is still the x-axis. Let's graph f of x equals 2 to the x minus 2 minus 1. This one is going to shift our graph to the right two units. And this negative one is going to shift our graph down one unit. So we'll start by graphing y equals 2 to the x again for comparison. So here's our graph, y equals 2 to the x, and we'll use that for comparison. We know this negative 2 is going to shift our graph to the right 2 units, and this negative 1 is going to shift it down 1 unit. So we'll do that for all of our points. We'll go to the right 2 units, and then go down 1. We'll go to the right 2 units, and then go down 1. We'll go to the right 2 units, down 1. And finally, go to the right two units and down one. We could do this for more than these four points. It depends on how accurate we want our image. So we'll finish our sketch. And we'll draw in our asymptote. The domain of this graph is negative infinity to infinity still. It goes to the left and right forever. For the range, it goes down to negative 1 and up forever. In this case, the asymptote was shifted down 1 also, so we know that the range is going to go from negative 1 to infinity. Example 4, let's solve 1 third raised to the x equals 81. So we're going to use one of our properties which states that a to the m equals a to the n implies that m equals n. So if I can get the bases the same, we can set the exponents equal to each other and we can use that to solve for x. In this case, we have a one-third base raised to the x equals 81. The bases are not the same, so I'll try to change this base to get to the same base on the right. I do not like fractions, so we'll use one of our properties. Recall x to the negative n equals 1 over x to the n. It also goes backwards. We can say that 3 to the negative 1 is equal to 1 third. So I'm going to replace 1 third with 3 to the negative 1. This becomes 3 to the negative 1 raised to the x equals 81. Now this negative 1 here can be multiplied with the x, so we have 3 to the negative x equals 81. Now I could change this to a base of 3, because I know 3 raised to something should give me 81. And using our calculator, we can quickly check the numbers. 3 to the negative x equals 3 to the fourth, because I know 3 to the 4th gives us 81. Now since the bases are the same, 
I can set the exponents equal to each other. So I know now negative x must be equal to 4. Divide both sides by negative 1, and x is equal to negative 4. And if we're not sure, we can always check our work by plugging it into here. So try that yourself. Make sure you check your work to make sure negative 4 is a good solution. Example 5, we have 2 raised to the x plus 4 equals 8 raised to the x minus 6. Again, the idea is to get the same base. Always try to get the same base. So I know this has a base of 2, so we'll try to get a base of 2 for the other side. 2 raised to what will give me 8? I know that's a 3. So 2 cubed gives me 8. So that's equivalent. And all we did is replace 8 with 2 cubed. Now we're very close to getting the same base. We just need to distribute the 3 to the x minus 6. We have 2 raised to the x plus 4 equals 2 raised to the 3x minus 18. Now they have the same base. I can set the exponents equal to each other. So we have x plus 4 equals 3x minus 18. Let's subtract x to both sides and let's add 18 to both sides. 22 equals 2x. Let's divide both sides by 2. And x is equal to 11. So this is our solution. x equals 11. And if we're not sure, we can always plug in those values in for the x. And we can check our work ourselves if we have time. So do that check to make sure that's a good solution. Example 6. Let's solve x to the 4 thirds equals 81. Recall x to the m over n is equal to the nth root of x raised to the m. Now, in this formula, we can have the m on the outside or the inside with the radical, and it will still be equivalent. I will leave it on the outside here because it's easier to solve the problem. So we have x to the 4 thirds can be written as the cube root of x raised to the 4th equals 81. We can take the fourth root of both sides now to get rid of the exponent. And we cannot forget the plus or minus since we're taking the fourth root which is an even index. This simplifies to the cube root of x is equal to plus or minus and the fourth root of 81 is just 3. I can get rid of the cube root now by raising both sides to a power of 3. So raise both sides to a power of 3. And x equals plus or minus 27. And this is our solution. We can also check our work by plugging it back in for x. Now we have multiple ways to solving x to the 4 thirds equals 81. So let's try an alternative method. I'm going to start to we'll raise both sides to a power of 3. And that reduces the left side to be x to the 4th equals 81 cubed. x to the 4th is now equal to 531,441. We can now take the 4th root of both sides. And we do not forget the plus or minus x is now equal to plus or minus and now we'll take the fourth root of 531,441 with our calculators and this gives us plus or minus 27 which is the same answer as we had earlier compound interest if p dollars are deposited in an account that pays an annual rate of interest r compounded n times per year then after t years the account will contain a dollars according to the following formula a equals p times the quantity 1 plus r over n raised to the tn power this is our formula to calculate compound interest example 7 suppose one thousand dollars is deposited into an account that pays 4% interest per year compounded quarterly, which means 4 times per year. Find the amount in the account after 10 years with no withdrawals. 
So we'll use the formula A equals P times 1 plus R over N raised to the TN. And then we'll look at our variables. Suppose we have $1,000. That means this $1,000 is our principal. The principal is how much money we started off with. We have 4% interest. So I know the interest rate is 0 0.04. Always convert this to a decimal. We know it's quarterly, so it means four times per year, so we'll put N as four. It says find the amount in the account after 10 years, so we know T is equal to 10. So we can plug everything into the formula. A equals 1,000 times 1 plus 0 0.04 divided by 4 raised to the... 10 times 4. So we have to do part of this on a calculator first. So let's try the problem on a calculator. We will do the inside of the parentheses first. And that's going to give us 1.01. .01. And I know 10 times 4 is 40. And now please type the whole thing in the calculator. And we will get the dollar amount. And this is approximately $1,488.86. Part B, how much interest is earned over the 10-year period? The interest earned for that period is $1,488.86 minus $1,000. Remember, we're taking the amount in the account and we're subtracting our principal. And that's going to give us the interest that we earn. So we have earned $488.86 of interest. Example 8. Becky must pay a lump sum of $6,000 in 5 years. What amount must be deposited today, present value, at 3.1% interest compounded annually, will grow to $6,000 in five years. So we'll use the same formula. A equals P times the quantity 1 plus R over N raised to the TN power. In this case, we're given that the lump sum has to be $6,000. So A must be $6,000. We're looking for the amount of money that we need to deposit it today. So that's the principal. The principal is unknown. The interest rate is 3.1%, so we'll convert that to 0 0.031. The time is 5 years, so we'll have the t equals 5. And it is compounded annually, that means 1 time per year, so n equals 1. So we'll plug everything into the formula, 6,000 equals P, which we don't know, times the quantity 1 plus 0 0.031 divided by 1 raised to the 5 times 1 power. So we have 6,000 equals P, and we'll simplify 1 plus 0 0.031 with a calculator. And that is 1.031 raised to the 5. The 1.031 raised to the 5 simplifies to about 1.1649. Now I can divide both sides by 1.1649. And this gives us a P of which rounds to approximately 5,150.66 dollars. So we have the principal that we need is about 5,150 dollars and 66 cents. B. If only 5,000 dollars is available to deposit now, what annual interest rate is necessary for the money to increase to $6,000 in 5 years. So we'll start with the formula again. A equals P times 1 plus R over N raised to the TN power. 
B. If only $5,000 is available to deposit now, what annual interest rate is necessary for the money to increase to $6,000 in five years? So we have here that A is going to be the 6000 because that's the money in the account. This 5000 has to be the principal, the amount of money we're starting off with. And we know the time is five years. Now we'll look at the formula. A equals P times 1 plus R over N raised to the TN power. The amount of money that we want to end up with is $6,000. Our principal is $5,000. The time is five years, and we're going to compound it annually, so we'll say n is 1. The interest rate is unknown. That is what we're looking for. So we'll plug it into the formula. We have 6,000 equals 5,000 times 1 plus r over 1 raised to the 1 times 5. Now we can simplify this by multiplying the 1 times 5 and dividing by the 1. So we have 6,000 equals 5,000 times 1 plus r raised to the 5. We'll divide both sides by 5,000. Six thousand divided by five thousand is just six fifths, and six fifths is equivalent to one plus r raised to the fifth. Let's take the fifth root of both sides, and so we have the fifth root of six fifths equals one plus r. Now I could solve for r by subtracting one to both sides, so r is equal to the fifth root of six fifths minus 1. Now we can type this in a calculator and we'll get our interest. And this is approximately 0 0.0371. So we need the interest to be 3.7%. So this is the amount of interest that we need in order to get $6,000 starting with $5,000 in 5 years. Continuous compounding. If P dollars are deposited at a rate of interest R compounded continuously, the keyword is continuously, for T years, the compound amount A dollars on deposit is given by the following formula. A equals P E raised to the RT power. This E is approximately 2.7182 and it's given on your calculator is usually located near the LN button. So look for the LN button on your calculator and you will most likely find the E. Example 9, suppose $5,000 is deposited in an account paying 3% interest compounded continuously for 5 years. Find the total amount on deposit at the end of 5 years. So we'll use our formula for continuous compounding. P e raised to the rt is equal to the amount in the account. So here we have $5,000 is the principal, how much money we start off with. The e is a constant on our calculator, so we don't need to find that number. r is our interest rate, and in this case is 3%, so we'll say r is 0 0.03. The time is 5 years. And that's all we need for this problem. So we'll plug it in. A equals 5,000. E raised to the 0 0.03 times 5. I'll simplify part of it first before we put it in the calculator. So we have 5,000 E raised to the, and we'll multiply 0 0.03 times 5. And this gives us 0 0.15. Now type the whole thing in a calculator. We have A is equal to, approximately equal to, $5,809.17.